This GPB original production is made possible by the Ray M. and Mary Elizabeth Lee Foundation and by the generous contributions of viewers like you. Thank you. There's nothing I can say now which can reduce my share of responsibility in the events of those years. In the 1960s, America was engulfed by two international conflicts, the Cold War and the war in Vietnam. We regard any nuclear missile as an attack. We cannot be defeated by force of arms. Two American presidents dominated the turbulent decade. Serving both was one Secretary of State. His name was Dean Rusk. Dean Rusk is one of the most important historical figures of the entire 20th century. Dean Rusk had great loyalty to his country. He had great loyalty to his president. As a trusted young soldier in World War II, it was Dean Rusk who divided Korea at the 38th parallel. As a rising star at the U.S. State Department, it was Dean Rusk who helped create the United Nations. As Secretary of State during the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was Dean Rusk who stood beside President Kennedy to stop World War III. And as Secretary of State under President Johnson, it was Dean Rusk who was reviled by many for his role in the Vietnam War. My dad will go down in history as an architect of perhaps the worst thing we've ever done in, done in foreign affairs with this war in Vietnam. It's a tragedy that such a gifted and special man is known primarily for the failure in Vietnam. In triumph or tragedy, Dean Rusk lived his life at the heartbeat of history. This is his story. I was born in 1909 on a hard scrabble farm in Cherokee County, Georgia. My father built our little house with his own hands. It was an impoverished lifestyle, really, and he was farming 40 acres with, I think, one mule. They grew all their food. Uh, they grew enough cotton for one bale per year. By 1912, Rusk's father gave up farming and moved the family to Atlanta, he got a job as a mail carrier, and the children worked too. I had a little red wagon and worked as a delivery boy for the neighborhood grocer. I was paid $3 a week. He worked his whole life from the time he was eight years old, growing up all through grade school and high school. Rusk wrote an extraordinary document when he was still a child. He wrote a paper while in junior high school at age 12, what I want to do with the next 12 years of my life. Rusk predicted he would graduate from Atlanta's most prestigious school, Boys High. He would graduate from Davidson College, one of the South's finest universities. And he would attend Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship. Dean Rusk was very religious, his family was religious, so this gave Dean Rusk an idea, I think, of uh, that he had a special mission in the world, that he had a, he had a calling. Every one of Rusk's boyhood predictions came true. By 1931, he was a Rhodes Scholar studying international affairs at Oxford University. Adolf Hitler was on the rise in Europe. As part of his Oxford studies, Rusk spent time in Germany. I was in Germany when Hitler seized power. I saw the Nazi stormtroopers rule the streets. It was very distressing to see what the Nazis were in the process of doing. His whole mindset, which carried over to Vietnam later on, his whole mindset was formed in the 1930s with the rise of Hitler. Rusk believed that Hitler could have been stopped, and I think this is something uh, most historians would agree with today, that the United States had to play a role in stopping aggression. Rusk returned to an America still gripped by the Great Depression in 1934. Jobs were scarce, but as an Oxford graduate, he landed a job teaching government at a girls' college in California. My mother was from Seattle, Washington originally, and then she went to Mills College in Oakland. 
and she met my father there, and he was a professor and she was a student. Brilliant and beautiful, Virginia Foisey had a passion for international studies, but dating a student was forbidden at Mills College. Our courtship was a little tricky, but we managed. Exuding an air of cool elegance, this grandly talented girl appealed to me in every way. Rusk married Virginia Foisey and became dean of the Mills College faculty at age 27. He entered law school, but his plans went up in smoke with World War II. Our son David was born in October 1940, and I was called to active duty two months later. Like many, we would know the despair of wartime separation. Rusk was sent to India, where he was in charge of war plans for Vinegar Joe Stilwell, commander of the China-Burma-India Theater in the war. When he gets pulled into the military during World War II, he likes it. He's doing tremendously important work. He's working with brilliant people. One lesson I learned from working with General Stilwell was that if you've got something to say, say it succinctly, and then shut up. A fast learner, Rusk was soon writing Stilwell's daily cables that were sent to General George Marshall in Washington. The whole strategy for World War II was Marshall's. He was the key player. General Marshall, we are most happy to receive you back into the United States. One of the great men of the 20th century, George Marshall would become Dean Rusk's mentor. Marshall inquired, who is writing uh, General Stilwell's cables? And he found out, well, it's Dean Rusk. Marshall brought Rusk to Washington and assigned him to the elite Lincoln Brigade, where he was given immense responsibilities. But the order to divide Korea for post-war occupation would haunt him. Working in great haste and using, of all things, a National Geographic map, we looked just north of Seoul for a convenient dividing line, but could not find one. We saw instead the 38th parallel and decided to recommend that. To my father's horror, that so-called temporary line became the more or less permanent division between North and South Korea. Without warning, the North Korean communist regime launched a brutal and unprovoked attack on the Republic of Korea. A divided Korea would later bring the Korean War. Rusk had only followed orders, yet he felt responsible. I was 36 at the time. We were forced by events to act as statesmen beyond our years. At the White House, George when George Marshall became President Truman's Secretary of State, he took Rusk with him. In less than five years, Rusk would be the number three man at the State Department. And he worked on uh, virtually everything. He was like Forrest Gump. He was everywhere. Sometimes I would hear on the news that they were in another country. My brother Dave asked at one point, and Pop had been traveling, and he was gone for so long, as he said, is, is Daddy dead? Virginia had raised the children almost as a single parent. Realizing the cost to his family, Rusk left government in 1952 to become president of the Rockefeller Foundation. I know that Dean Rusk considered uh, being president of the Rockefeller Foundation is the, the best job on earth. Rusk planned to spend the rest of his career at the Rockefeller Foundation. Then in 1960, John F. Kennedy was elected president. In Mr. Kennedy's first public appearance, a supreme national effort will be needed in the years ahead to move this country safely through the 1960s. Rusk was mystified when President-elect Kennedy asked him to be his Secretary of State. The two men had never met. I think one of the reasons Kennedy selected Dean Rusk was the fact that he heard from numerous people that Rusk is loyal. Rusk will carry out your policies. During the ball, the president with the first lady and the vice president and Mrs. Johnson introduces the members of the new cabinet, the secretary of state, Dean Rusk, and Mrs. Rusk, secretary of defense, Robert McNamara, and Mrs. McNamara. Rusk and his president were from two different worlds. Kennedy and Rusk never really became buddies. Rusk didn't go to the Kennedy's parties or have that sort of relationship. 
uh, but there was a good deal of respect. Kennedy took office at the height of the Cold War. The Soviet Union seemed bent on world domination. The Western allies, led by the U.S., were equally committed to stop the spread of communism. The heart of the Cold War conflict was Berlin. As the communist barrier between East and West Berlin... In Soviet-controlled East Germany, people risked their lives to flee communist rule by entering West Berlin. Hoping to solve the Berlin crisis, Kennedy took Rusk with him to Vienna for a summit with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was very belligerent. He ended up telling President Kennedy that he had to get out of Berlin. And he tries to bully uh, Kennedy on the issue when they meet for the first time. He gave President Kennedy a deadline. And if you try anything, there will be war. America was unwilling to abandon West Berlin to the Soviets. Kennedy told Rusk to find a diplomatic solution. We now had a real crisis on our hands. I saw nothing that we could negotiate. My own position was to talk the question to death. I did not want to go to war over Berlin. Rusk saw his role as putting off that nuclear war as long as he could. And any year that he was able to work things out with the Soviets, he felt was a victory. Over the next several months, Rusk met with Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko, so often that the two became friendly. They had a warm relationship. They could read each other's minds. During this time, the Berlin Wall was built and the December deadline passed, all without incident between the two superpowers. Rusk had talked the problem to death. But the Cold War was far from over. October 1962, U.S. intelligence detected Soviet missile sites in Cuba. Russian ships bearing nuclear warheads were headed to the island. America went on high alert. Air Defense Command interceptors and tactical air command fighter and reconnaissance aircraft join Navy, Marine, and SAC to maintain watch on the 2,000 ships known to be in the Atlantic. The Kennedy administration had the unfortunate luck to experience the most dangerous crisis the world has ever seen, the Cuban Missile Crisis. With the facts now before him, President Kennedy calls in his top advisors and decides to address the nation. Kennedy's inner circle of advisors split into two camps. One group advocated a blockade of Cuba, just cut off Cuba by sea until the missiles are removed. The second group advocated an airstrike, take out the missiles. Fearing the airstrike would lead to nuclear war, Rusk strongly advised Kennedy to go with the blockade. The president agreed. Next thing I knew, uh, security men with submachine guns moved into the basement of our house. The idea was that if uh, missiles began to fly, that uh, my sister Peg and I would be uh, evacuated uh, with my mom and dad out of some caves in West Virginia. As the crisis deepened, Kennedy needed the backing of world leaders. He turned to Rusk, who got the job done. In the greatest display of hemisphere solidarity since World War II, the Organization of American States unanimously endorses the actions of the United States and many pledge arms and men to the cause. To carry out the resolution sponsored by Secretary of State Dean Rusk, thus uniting all of the Americas in a common cause. On October 22, 1962, President Kennedy spoke to the nation. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. After Kennedy's speech, Rusk briefed the ambassadors of 60 nations and then met with the press corps at the State Department. He arrived home at 2 a.m. It would be a long night. We literally went to sleep thinking, well, during the night, is there going to be a nuclear attack, a nuclear exchange? Finally, after six anxiety-ridden days, the Soviet Union agreed to withdraw the Cuban missiles, and the world could breathe again. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a defining moment in the history of the Cold War. It was a point at which we, both sides, recognized that we had come so close to nuclear war 
that we had to back off and do something else. Khrushchev had not responded with a nuclear strike. The next morning as daylight broke, I thought, we're still here. On August 5th, 1963, Rusk was in Moscow to sign the world's first nuclear test ban treaty on behalf of the United States. An elated Premier Khrushchev invited Rusk to play badminton at his villa. Rusk diplomatically lost the match, but the world was the clear winner. The test ban treaty opened the door to future agreements and a general lessening of Cold War tensions. Such is the legacy of what President Kennedy felt was his proudest achievement. A dark page in the annals of America has been written to the crack of an assassin's bullet. Beginning as strangers, Kennedy and Rusk had forged their relationship in crisis after crisis. After the president's death, Rusk, along with the world, was devastated. He was in the living room, and just as I entered, a sob, I guess you'd have to call it, escaped from him. Just one. I knew he didn't want it to. I knew he didn't want me to see it. So I turned around and left. Four days after Lyndon Johnson became president, Rusk submitted his resignation. It was not accepted. Rusk felt if the president of the United States says he needs you, you can't turn him down. You have to serve. Johnson and Rusk had much in common, including friendship. They were both uh, Southern. They both uh, believed in passionately in civil rights. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is signed... Working behind the scenes with Congress, Rusk helped Johnson pass his landmark civil rights legislation of the 1960s. Lyndon Johnson saved the South and the nation from a terrible racial division. If he had not acted as forthrightly and as decisively as he did, God only knows what would have happened. The struggle for civil rights would come to Rusk's own doorstep. In 1967, his daughter Peggy announced she was marrying Guy Smith, a black man. As a father, Rusk was deeply concerned. I know that he was worried that it just wouldn't succeed and that we were letting ourselves in for a lot of heartbreak, possibly even some danger. Well, Peg was only 18, uh, still kind of young, and Guy was getting ready to head for Vietnam as a helicopter pilot. We were not trying to make any statement. We were not rebelling against anything. It was nothing but just the fact that we had met, fallen in love, couldn't imagine living life without each other, and that's all there was to it. Rusk was not only worried about his daughter, he was worried about the presidency. Following a Tuesday lunch meeting, Secretary Rusk asked for some private time with President Johnson alone. I heard on the news that my father had offered his resignation to President Johnson, and President Johnson had declined. Further thing from President Johnson's mind uh, was to accept Dean Rusk's resignation uh, over that. The marriage made national news. The public didn't seem to care that Guy Smith was a Georgetown graduate serving in Vietnam. The young couple received hate mail, death threats, and angry stares. And so I just got in the habit of not looking people in the eye. I just felt it was safer not to. Meanwhile, Johnson and Rusk were preoccupied with a small country in Southeast Asia. Johnson had inherited the Vietnam conflict from Kennedy, but a North Vietnamese attack on a U.S. ship in the Gulf of Tonkin it empowered Johnson to escalate the conflict into a war. But this is really war. It is guided by North Vietnam, and it is spurred by communist China. Its goal is to conquer the South and to extend the Asiatic dominion of communism. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had long urged an expansion of the war. 
In the early years uh, of the Kennedy administration, Rusk and McNamara were, had, were on different sides of uh, escalation in Vietnam. Rusk was opposed to escalation and McNamara was in favor. Johnson's decision to escalate the war created a moral crisis for Rusk. He went through an agony of indecision back in 1964, for sure. And I can remember him lying on the living room floor of our house there in Washington, D.C. And I'd go in there and I'd say, Pop, what's the matter? And he said, my stomach hurts. His family was worried about him, uh, his health and his mental well-being. But he made up his mind that he had to stay. He was going to protect the president. Of all the decisions Dean Rusk made in his life, this was perhaps the defining moment. But once committed, he never looked back. I put my reservations aside and advised the president to send an additional 100,000 men. As long as the South Vietnamese were prepared to fight for themselves, we had to help them. So did the casualties. Americans took to the streets. Anti-war demonstrators protest U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in mass marches, rallies, and demonstrations. Rusk's son, Rich, was a student at Cornell, a hotbed of the anti-war movement. I told him how my generation was feeling about this war and how it, it just seemed like we were pouring all these young lives down the drain. He was much more opinionated about Vietnam than I was. He took it more personally. I got more or less uh, obsessed by what was going on in that part of the world with all that death and destruction, all that killing. I know that uh, Rich Rusk was deeply wounded by the escalation in Vietnam. And the doctors told me that uh, I was having a nervous breakdown. It was very much resulting from my dad's uh, decisions as Secretary of State. As Johnson's spokesman for the war, Rusk was vilified on college campuses and in the press. Had he been the baby killer that my classmates suspected he was, I wouldn't have been bothered by all that, but I, I adored my father. He was a wonderful man, and he thought he was doing the right thing by making our stand in South Vietnam. Rich Rusk um, ended up moving as far away from Washington and Dean Rusk that he could. I went off to uh, Nome, Alaska, which is about 5,000 miles from Washington, D.C., and there I was for the next 14 years. And of course, this was uh, heart-wrenching for Dean Rusk himself. With protests raging outside the White House, Johnson met with his senior foreign policy staff every Tuesday at lunch. The most powerful voice in the room the one that President Johnson respected the most was the voice of Dean Rusk. When you have everybody pushing the president from the left or from the right, uh, somebody has to be the opposite of whoever's pushing. So when the generals would come in wanting to bomb uh, Vietnam, uh, it was Dean Rusk's job to raise the question of why this would not be good. And so the record seems very clear to us. Hanoi is presently resisting the road to peace. Rusk tirelessly I sought diplomatic solutions to the war, but nothing worked. As U.S. soldiers died in the thousands, Americans grew increasingly angry with the war planners in the White House. McNamara, all these people left, and people that had gotten us into this <laughs> had left. National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy left in 1966. Robert McNamara left in 1968. Only Rusk remained. I think the fact that all these people left made Dean Rusk uh, stay. But it was tiring. Uh, he was not well. 
He was a, became a chain smoker. He, 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 had, he drank scotch every day. The scotch, uh, he leaned on it heavily in 1968, which was just a terrible year for the entire country, Vietnam and back here at home. On March 31st, 1968, President Johnson spoke to the nation about Vietnam. He saved the punchline for the end. I shall not seek, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Richard Nixon was elected president in 1968. The Vietnam War would continue for another seven years. As Secretary of State, I made two serious mistakes with respect to Vietnam. First, I overestimated the patience of the American people. And second, I underestimated the tenacity of the North Vietnamese. America lost the war in Vietnam. U.S. troops pulled out April 30th, 1975, leaving the South Vietnamese to their fate. Fifty-eight thousand American dead, three million Vietnamese. Oh, America paid a great price. The Vietnam War was uh, was just a tragedy. I just think of the of all of those names and the people and uh, their lives uh, that were lost and the people close to them. It's just a tragedy. I regret more than I can possibly say the casualties and suffering of every war fought in my lifetime. I had devoted my life to the search for peace, but it was my unique tragedy to participate in three wars and as Secretary of State to preside over one. Dean Rusk leaves a legacy of honor, of loyalty, of service to his nation. We need to look hard at those people who work quietly and anonymously behind the scenes, because ultimately they are the ones that are shaping our destiny. I could sit and listen to him all day long, and the thing I enjoyed the most about any party was just being near where he was speaking. Every year he'd overpay his income taxes. I said, Pop, why are you doing this? You're the only taxpayer in America who's doing this. And he said, well, I believe in paying taxes. You have to respect a country that'll allow a barefoot boy from Cherokee County become its Secretary of State. This GPB original production is made possible by the Ray M. and Mary Elizabeth Lee Foundation and by the generous contributions of viewers like you. Thank you.